Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Here are your hosts, Trent Kling and Leighton Kling. Welcome to this edition of the Retail Focus Podcast. Trent and Leighton Kling with you. Few earnings releases this week, so we'll be taking a look at the big macro with some CPI reports and retail sales data from the month of March in the U.S. We'll take a look at the only midweek earnings report, that coming from Pier 1. Fred's was initially scheduled to release earnings, but they rescheduled their call because of their strategic initiatives they've got going down. And an e-commerce native branching out into the world of pop-up stores. We'll talk about that in the second half of the show. Please rate us and subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, SoundCloud, Podcast Addict, or however you catch us weekly, including on Spotify. We would appreciate the feedback. Certainly helps our visibility in the podcasting universe, but mostly we just like hearing from you. And as such, reach out on Twitter at Retail Podcast. Feel free to shoot us an email, retailpodcast at gmail.com. So we begin, as I mentioned, with the macro. On Monday, the Commerce Department and specifically the U.S. Census Bureau released approximate retail sales for March. The unrevised figures look particularly healthy as consumer confidence is relatively high on the backdrop of getting delayed tax returns. While there are always going to be complicating factors that many in the mainstream can point to for any results, We do have to look at these results with a wider lens than most, and we'll look at some of these monthly comps first, but Leighton, I think one of the things coming out of that is even the more negative media sources mentioned that retail sales were up even though they weren't bad in the first two months of the year. Retail sales were up 0.6% during the month of March over the month of February. And while this figure made bold, italicized headlines, we have to turn to the most commonly cited legacy same-store sales comparisons in which we look at sales on a fiscal year comparable basis to really get a feel of how U.S. retailing economy is faring in the big picture. Retail sales for March were up month over month. Like I said, over the last two years, they've actually largely beat expectations for the month of March, despite what you may have heard or read elsewhere. That said, this March ended up beating 2017's revenue mark by about 4.5%. And this 4.5% figure, trend, while including car dealership sales and restaurant sales, is much needed to boost the economy and really pushing back those pesky retail bears that we often speak of on this podcast. Earlier this year, the NRF ended up projecting an overall retail sales growth rate between 3.8% and 4.4% in 2018, including a 10 to 12% boost for online and what they call non-store sales. We should know that those projections did not count car dealership sales, gas stations, or restaurant sales. Still, we can see that these figures, the 4.5% year-over-year figure, is meeting expectations set forth by the industry as a whole, if not beating those larger numbers. And for reference, total retail sales gained 3.9% last year, according to the NRF, while inflation was just around 2%. So retail sales, despite, Trent, what you read in the headlines or hear on other podcasts, they're actually doubling the inflation rate. So to shed some light on what this means for the entire retail industry, we have to take a look at how the government arrives at the figures that they do. And this is important because Other than reading those headlines, those big headlines from big media outlets such as CNBC, we really have to get a feel for how these figures are calculated. Every month, questionnaires are mailed to a probability sample of approximately 4,700 employer firms selected from the larger monthly retail trade survey. Sales data is then given often by larger firms here in the United States, and their response gets put into a weighted average. And this is why, Trent, a lot of times you'll see numbers ended up revised later on down the line, months, even years later on when they get different figures coming in. And because of the incoming figures and predictions based off this data can never be exact, there is some wiggle room, at least in the present, on these comps, usually plus or minus 0.5%. Still, the data we have seen throughout the last two and a half years of doing this podcast seems to line up with the larger retail picture and can give us a deeper look into what categories are performing well and which ones have an opportunity to get better with the right campaigns and the right marketing influence. We see for the last month, big ticket categories trend performed exceedingly well, looking to boost average ticket for some retailers. Furniture and appliances, you talk about big ticket categories, they both rose 3.9% for furniture, 1% for appliances. 
year over year. And again, year over year, not month over month, as Leighton referenced. Clothing and accessories rose 1.8% versus 2017's figures, but were down slightly over the month of February. The only noticeable hit we came across was department stores overall, reporting negative year over year comps off 0.9% since March of 2017, and I don't know that that's completely unexpected. We've talked about certain department stores like Dillard's, for example, able to increase sales, but a lot of those legacy department stores have really been struggling of late, so really no surprise to see negative year-over-year comps for that as a category. According to Retail Metrics, March same-store sales rose a better-than-expected 8.1%, and Retail Metrics expects First quarter retail earnings to rise 15% year over year, according to comments that Retail Dive collected via email. Now, margins have been rather healthy. Companies are also enjoying tax returns and deciding on how to split up the funds between employee compensation, capital improvements, or needed expansion either with the store or with the warehouse on that side of things. But still, just to recap, March same-store sales rose 8.1% according to retail metrics. That is an incredible number and a number far beyond what a lot of people out there did expect for the month when taken as a whole. Now let's talk about CPI, which we referenced at the beginning of this story. The Consumer Price Index, it's always a great way to get a feel for how much more or less the average consumer is spending on day-to-day -day goods. And while increasing prices kind of help the top line of both big and and small retailers, it can be a tricky game in making sure consumer sentiment isn't hurt by those higher costs at checkout. Basically, if consumers get a little bit of that sticker shock, they might shy away from spending as much money as what they are, so it becomes a balancing act. Larger prices charged, of course, means larger top-line revenue as long as consumer sentiment remains strong and as long as your traffic numbers do not suffer. The Labor Department's Consumer Price Index may have weighed on gas station receipts as gas station sales dropped 0.3% month over month. This is the most since July, according to the Commerce Report. And excluding automobiles and gasoline, which are oftentimes glommed together in retail data, sales receipts went up 0.3% overall for a second month in a row. Now, this is almost counterintuitive in that one of the biggest input costs for getting goods to retailers is gasoline. That went down by an equal margin that general merchandise goods went up. Factoring in lead times, we can see that previous fuel cost increases have led to moderate adjustments in other categories, and that changes, while they are correlated, do not happen overnight. You're looking at a little bit of a delay. Now, latent views have varied after both of these reports came out, but I think our view generally echoes the sentiment overall from a lot of economists. Yeah, I think there's going to be a slight trickle-down effect from those tax returns and some unforeseen company bonuses that a lot of people have been reporting. After all, a lot of big-name retailers such as Walmart had issued bonuses for their most tenured employees earlier this year, and this was on top of individual performance bonuses. So a lot of people are getting a boost, again, not only from tax returns and some different tax accounting benefits, but overall you're seeing a very healthy economy as wages are up just slightly above inflation right now, but still on the rise, albeit modestly. However, there are going to be some bigger issues that remain for the rest of the year. Those variables include a slew of geopolitical issues which involve the sanctity of freer trade throughout different countries and throughout North America, military conflict, and immigration reform. Certain industries that are in the midst of tariff uncertainty, like those surrounding agriculture and aircraft, could taper hiring and cut back on proposed wage hikes. However, as it pertains to the retail industry, you don't see a lot of that. Some of the immigration talk does affect the retail sector, but we're talking about the big picture in terms of agriculture and aircraft. Some price hikes with aluminum may be coming down the pipeline, but again, nothing is set in stone. Most of this is just talk. Additionally, there may be some issues domestically, which could hurt some short-term consumer sentiment, such as political unrest and a maturing e-commerce landscape that presents a buyer's learning curve for many. So obviously, if you're new to the e-commerce industry, looking around for the best price, it may come at a cost. Overall, people tend to drift online when trying to compare different like items to see what the cheapest prices may be. But Overall, these can be seen as variables for the retail industry down the line. A lot of variables that analysts don't necessarily have the answers for other than to say volatility is on the horizon. 
Well, Pier 1 Imports released their fourth quarter fiscal 2018 earnings after the bell on Wednesday, April 18th. Zach's consensus analyst expectations were $0.18 cents a share, down from earnings of $0.34 cents per share during last year's fourth quarter. The last year had been an up-and-down one for the specialty goods retailer, with two quarterly losses that were ticked in. In particular, the third quarter was rough, with lower-than-expected ticket size and traffic They've remained fairly quiet over the last four months. You haven't heard about them on our podcast, at least, with the exception of a January hire of Nancy Walsh as their new CFO. Walsh came from, as you may have seen on the news, Bonton, which has actually been going through some liquidation sales of their own. So overall, potentially not the best CFO hire, but she was able to get off the ship before it eventually was starting to sink. The problem is she may have rowed her lifeboat to another sinking ship with Pier 1 Imports. Throughout their earnings call, it was mostly negative news as the net sales for the company decreased 3.1% to $512.2 million, which included a $27.5 million extra week in sales for the company's fiscal 2018 quarter. And to put that in perspective, their fourth quarter last year included 13 weeks. This year, it included 14 weeks, yet still a drop, a drastic drop by 3.1% when a lot of people were looking at the year in its entirety and thinking that potentially they could bring forth a little bit better numbers in terms of sales and same store sales, which we'll get into in a little bit. The sales drop was a result of a number of things, but I think same store sales probably chief among them as Pier 1 is in a bit of a transitionary period. We'll talk about some of the initiatives that they talked about, not only on this earnings call, but that they've talked about in the past. They had their investor day as well this week on Thursday. Now, their same store sales fell off a whopping 7.5%. This is brutal, even as their e-commerce sales went up. By the way, they combine their e-commerce and -and brick-and-mortar stores in their same-store sales. So you look at e-commerce sales, which were up for the company, their same-store sales ended up being down low teens. They don't break that out specifically, but it was confirmed on the earnings call by their CEO that indeed their brick-and-mortar same-store sales were down low teens as both a function of lower traffic and ticket sizes also don't break out specifics there. They blamed low brick-and-mortar sales on more of their customers going to their website. You think about that, uh, that's kind of circular reasoning since overall same store sales, including their website sales, were still down. So they didn't really answer for the reasons why, other than to say, they did mention this a few times, that they felt like their merchandise mix might be a little bit stale and they're having trouble creating a true value proposition for the consumer. Now, e-commerce sales did grow 22% year over year and penetration or amount of total revenue from e-commerce sales that grew as well. Now, e-commerce makes up 25% of the total revenue, and they've made a lot about moving towards an e-commerce model at Pier 1 over the last six years in particular, over the last two, as they've championed an omni-channel approach. And if you're anywhere near a Pier 1 earnings call, you're going to hear that word repeated time and again. 25% of overall sales coming from e-commerce, that's better than industry average, or more, I should say, maybe not better, but more than industry average. Yet at the same time, still not enough to overcome their tepid brick and mortar same store sales numbers. Now on the bright side, or at least the marginal bright side, the company did beat on gap earnings per share figures by a penny, Their 19 cents per share included a tax benefit of 4 cents per share. Without this benefit, they would have missed expectations by 3 cents, as it stands to reason. Some of the more interesting full-year figures bring us to question their longer strategic direction. Reason being, they were actually able to achieve positive same-store sales for the full year overall, as well as better overall e-commerce penetration in the first three quarters than what they got in the fourth quarter, which many expected to be as good or better than second and third quarter marks. And they even said on last quarter's call that things were going well in November, but they hit a December wall. And that last call was in December, in the middle of the shopping season. But perhaps the biggest bombshell Leighton on the call came via a message from the board of directors regarding the dividend. Looks like they're going to have a discontinuation of said dividend. Their dividend was pretty high, around $0.07 on a quarterly basis, or around 8% dividend yield heading into this earnings call. Still, the dividend was pretty much the only reason why many institutional investors stayed aboard and held their shares 
for the company in the long term. Institutional investors, according to NASDAQ, make up 77.9% of their current shareholder base. So you look at that number, Trent, that is a lot of institutional shareholders with Pier 1. Now they do not receive the dividend. So perhaps they could better utilize that capital and funnel it elsewhere, then get out of Pier 1, causing maybe more of a downturn in that company's stock. For their projections, right up front in one of their first statements made on the call, Alastair James, their CEO, mentioned they project a loss in fiscal year 2019. Again, they had a profit for fiscal 2018. Not good news for the company. He mentioned that there are no good, very bad quarter proves that the company needed to take steps back and reassess things going forward, putting into play some of their newer initiatives. Pier 1 has been very clear about what they feel is a full omnichannel capability having been reached, trumpeting this back in 2016. As a result, you could understand why they might not see massive room for growth in their e-commerce efforts since there aren't too many huge initiatives coming down the pike. They still see e-commerce growth going forward. However, Alastair James, their CEO again, did mention the possibility of an app during their latest earnings call in December. He seemed to be fairly warm to the idea as 60% of their customers are on their phones when inside a Pier 1. They did not reference this during the call, however. As it is, their efforts in e-commerce have produced analysts beating digital sales numbers. Of this, they've seen larger increases from what they call cash wrap PC or customers shopping on their site while in store. Still though, this has increased nearly 30% in the last two quarters year over year. Now I want to talk about some of the interesting initiatives that Pier 1 has going on, either that they've referenced during this call, they've referenced during the investor day, or referenced during prior calls. Now, I was on the earnings call just moments before we actually recorded this podcast, and some of the things coming from this call were difficult to swallow, I think, for analysts overall. But the point still remains that one of their main focuses is on inventory and they feel like they can use less inventory to actually drive traffic and increase ticket size at their stores to increase top line revenue that's not a concept you hear about a whole lot but let's break this down now james the ceo has touched before on the idea of perceived scarcity motivating their customers to buy and they want to use that along with inventory control to attempt to spur sales. To this point, they've been kind of in a similar conundrum as L Brands. Their loyal customers pretty much wait for sales and promotions to buy. And James mentioned that the customers also will notice how much of a particular product is in stock. He said they've noticed that when there is less of a product on the floor, customers tend to go ahead and buy that product a little bit more. The other thing that customers do is they've been waiting for these promotions to splurge on items. As a result, Pier 1 has consciously been lowering margins on discounting to drive traffic but now a lot of their main customers have come to rely on the lower price points that pier one attempted to convey to the customers in order to drive that traffic up in the first place and to make matters worse as we saw from december and february in this latest quarter customers are no longer responding to their promotional pricing game as traffic is down though it is up online James said specifically during this call that customers perceive that Pier 1's value is lesser than their competitors. This means that they both eroded margins with this pricing activity, while at the same time, their top line revenue shrank. This is a recipe for disaster. I don't have to tell you that. And although they didn't mention it as such, either on this call or in previous calls, this is very similar, this concept, both with perceived scarcity and a value proposition to the bargain hunt ideal that is fueling high sales in the off-price segment. Customers have a reason to buy a product immediately at a retailer like TJ Maxx or Marshalls or Ross or Ollie's bargain outlet because there is no guarantee it will be routinely stocked. It could be the only time you see that particular product in the store and so it's here that stores are actually beginning to transition somewhat for pier one they've started it off with one store but they were able to knock down inventory overall across their store chain in this last quarter so rather than full shelves and a full sales floor which we might mention you know pier one oftentimes is known for being not necessarily messy but certainly a cramped sales floor especially for someone like me who's 6'5 has very long legs and has a tendency to run into things on the sales floor their focus is largely on limiting what is on the floor and how much of what is on the floor is out there 
to spur what James referred to as a psychological impulse in their customers. Many of their customers are routine shoppers at Pier 1. They don't draw a lot of new customers in. So Pier 1 feels as though this is going to be an effective format simply because of how often their loyal customers visit stores. Sometimes every other week, sometimes every week and because of how much of their revenue comes from that loyal base. In theory, this should also allow them to cut inventory costs. I say in theory, but it was borne out in this quarter. Cost of inventory on hand fell by 14%, and that's despite the dramatic reduction in sales. Usually you see a drop in same-store sales and a drop in overall top-line revenue. Sometimes you see an increase in inventory when that drop wasn't expected. But here on this call, they did mention that this inventory reduction is part of their larger plan. They're aware that the scarcity of one type of item might be a deterrent to some of their customer base, but that's a risk they're willing to take. They don't mind chasing off maybe an interior decorator here and a staging company there in order to really affect the buying habits of their loyal customers. And it does seem as though this is one initiative that could pay off in the long term for margins. And it was kind of interesting on the call. Analysts were actually asking about the reduced inventory and they asked if this was because of tepid buying or because they didn't have the cash on hand. And the company said, no, this is something that we are working on. This is something that we were working on doing, just having fewer of every item on the sales floor to create that perceived scarcity there. However, there are some other things that Pier 1 could be doing that they're not including a refresh in merchandise acquisition. Despite calling their products stale on the call, they openly admitted to not having adjusted their purchasing practices, and they didn't see any changes forthcoming. In addition to lower stock tests, they're trying out an outlet store concept and different pricing mechanics in two different stores in their portfolio. James wasn't specific, but he did speak to two of the three concepts as being encouraging and the third being what he called a learning experience. Wouldn't say which one it was, though. Finally, something they mentioned during the call was sourcing product at a lower cost. They've been frustrated as they purchase a certain product and design carry that product at a certain price point and then see the same product or similar product somewhere else for much less. They have indicated the desire to work with their suppliers closely to get the cost prices down. And this is very important for this retailer. As you can tell that the fully omni-channel experience is not necessarily bringing in the right customers or at least the right amount of sales to sustain long-term growth. Although not much has gone right recently for Pier 1 Imports, one thing we must do is commend Alistar James' desire to grow top-line numbers, and he was clear in driving that on the call. He basically said that cost-cutting will only do so much for the long term, and that they must place their focus on growing top-line to develop as a company. This runs contrary to what we've heard with other struggling retailers, most notably Sears and the Asina Retail Group both of whom have focused exclusively on cost-cutting during their calls. During the report, after it came out on Wednesday, the stock dropped quite a bit. Looking at Pier 1 Imports' stock ticker, PIR, the stock reacted exactly how one would think, coming into the call around $3.46 a share, while a day prior, it was around $3.68 a share. Ended up falling to $2.85 in after-hours trading, likely a combination of three things, loss of that dividend for those institutional investors, poor same-store sales, and confirmation of an anticipated loss for the fiscal year in 2019. This is, according to After Hours Trading, a 52-week low for the company. When we return after the music, we'll talk about a Supreme Court case, and we'll talk about an e-commerce pure play retailer that's making the jump into pop-up stores. South Dakota has been making the rounds as they attempt to put a 27-year-old law to rest with a Supreme Court case that questions e-commerce retailers who don't collect sales tax in the states that they are not in physically, either through a brick-and-mortar setting or in a warehouse setting. South Dakota is among nine states that doesn't have income tax, a measure designed to spur in-state development and investment leading to strong, longer-term job creation. If you think of this implementation, you're looking at uh, sort of a rule that has it to where maybe more people are going to be entrepreneurial and then hire through that, and then that will spur in-state development. South Dakota, therefore, is highly dependent on their state sales tax to fund payroll 
and other big infrastructure projects. In 2016, South Dakota created a law that requires out-of-state online retailers to collect sales tax if they clear $100,000 in sales or have over 200 separate transactions. The state sued a group of online retailers to force them to collect the state sales tax. And you see with the aim of overturning the 1992 precedent, this group included up and coming retailers such as Wayfair.com, but also older retailers that have been around the block a few times, such as Newegg and Overstock.com. Well, on Tuesday of this week, the Supreme Court debated the merits of this particular case, seemingly questioning making a change of the 1992 law on a state level. Rather, they were talking about making a more federal mandate in which all states would have to issue a state sales tax on virtual retailers, whether or not they have a brick and mortar store or whether or not they have a warehouse nearby. So a lot of people were looking at this with wide eyes, looking to see exactly what was going to happen and whether or not the Supreme Court is going to side on the states or on the retailers. In the broader argument has always been that retailers that are online only can avoid issuance of state sales taxes or charging their customers state sales taxes. Those have an inherent advantage versus the conventional brick and mortar stores. And we've heard this take repeated a lot most recently now, of course, in South Dakota. And more importantly, many of these stores that are seen as in trouble as a result of the 1992 legislation are older, well-known retailers like Macy's and Sears. However, the rebuttal here is that they lost a key competitive advantage because they were too slow to invest in online platforms. Still, these larger retailers, let's say Macy's, for example, they're in most states. So they would either have to charge sales tax anyway, or if they were in a state they weren't in, would have to tweak their software a little bit to make sure that they weren't collecting sales tax in those particular states. And ultimately, they may still lose out to these retailers because of that 7 to 8% sales tax savings that the retailers without a warehouse or location in certain states would have. Now, some studies show that annualized tax income with laws like this passed throughout the country would increase by $18 billion. Now, that's not to say that online sales may fall a little bit as a result of legislation like this, but this would be a big relief in some Midwestern states that are hundreds of millions of dollars in the hole. For this case, South Dakota has claimed it could make up to $50 million more if they could collect from out-of-state retailers that do deliver to its residents. $50 million for a state like South Dakota is a pretty penny. The larger domestic political pictures have helped to publicize this case a little bit and has caused some to pick sides that may have state interests at hold while also being stakeholders in the modern retail industry. For example, we know Trump has been against Amazon in the recent past, lashing out at the retailer for avoiding taxes and putting stress on the United States Postal Service's model. This despite ample evidence that disputes the latter. In fact, the USPS Postal Service is largely in the red because of longstanding pension obligations for its retirees. But Amazon packages as a whole are said to be profitable, and I can confirm this through a couple of people I know in the Postal Service industry that are fairly high up that have confirmed that Amazon is in many ways keeping USPS afloat even. But regardless of that, Amazon is one of those companies that actually does have to pay sales tax or does charge their customers sales tax in a lot of states because Amazon has a lot of distributorships in a lot of different states. So if they've got a hold in a particular state, chances are good you're paying sales tax. And I went through my personal Amazon purchases, Leighton, and I can tell you that on over 90% of the purchases I made from Amazon in the last year, I actually paid sales tax on those. But other entities are going to be put in a bit of a more complex bind. Now, the NRF, the National Retail Federation, they're in support of South Dakota, even though they represent many e-commerce companies and they have one of the largest e-commerce conferences in the country in the annual shop.org conference. They fund a lot of digital companies conferences as well that promote online only sales tools. In addition to this, Amazon is a current paying NRF member. Amazon, of course, would be hurt in some states by having to either lower prices or take the sales tax hit. But again, longer term for Amazon, it may not matter all that much because in the grand majority of states, they have warehouses and it's going to be the case where they have warehouses in even more states as they continue to grow. Perhaps a bigger question regarding Amazon is the tax implication on third-party companies that use Amazon fulfillment and this is where the gray area comes in because they're arguably the ones that would be competing and I quote most unfairly because while they 
go through Amazon and go through Amazon fulfillment, they themselves don't have those resources and don't have those warehouses in different locations. But there's another take regarding Amazon that's not very often heard, but Leighton, it seems very logical, and it comes via Grover Norquist, who we admit is very, very much anti-tax. Yeah, he told CNBC on Tuesday that if there were a reversal of the 1992 tax law requiring a physical presence in states in order to be taxed, then Amazon would still be in the clear and a long-term winner. Norquist went on to describe what he believes is a fairly clear-cut case of taxation without representation if this were to have been reversed in the future. And on behalf of Amazon, where they don't participate and have a physical presence in a particular state, why should they pay taxes is something that he purports. But overall, additionally, he puts out that smaller e-commerce businesses would be having to pay more in terms of administrative costs because of different tax codes and being under what he described as 10,000 different tax jurisdictions in some cases. And that by having to farm out these taxing duties, these accounting duties, Amazon would end up being the winner because they would be getting more income if companies decided to switch their selling platform to use Amazon's seller platform. That would be theoretically more streamlined in ongoing tax implications for the smaller company's sales. Also, you have to question the ultimate consequence of using different tax software if things get a little bit more complicated, as he points out. If a company were to stay independent of the seller's platform and then have to get the taxes done, Trent, there are a lot of accounting firms out there that are backed up on AWS, which, of course, is one of Amazon's biggest drivers for their profit. In conclusion, Orquist basically stated that U.S. tax laws need to be more modern and simplified, evolving to acknowledge the massive presence of online sales and to make things more efficient for businesses of all sizes, so both large and small business. And we should mention in summary that some states already charge a comp use tax to residents based on their income level if they conduct any purchasing of goods online or via mail order for the few mail order items that still exist anyway. That's right. And so in some cases, the states already collect at least a little bit of tax that would otherwise be collected via sales tax off of their residence. Now, typically, this isn't very much. Sometimes comp use tax will range from $25 per person to maybe $100 or more per person. Still, the sales tax, as you mentioned, if this South Dakota challenge is upheld and South Dakota gets to collect sales tax from these companies, it will open up an interesting circumstance, especially for e-commerce companies that are just starting up. And speaking of those, we get to our final story. E-commerce Pure Play Brandless releases plans to roll out a pop-up store in early May. This from Retail Dive contributing editor Daphne Howland and also a press release that Brandless sent out to multiple news outlets, including us earlier this week. Now, we talked with Brandless co-founder and CEO Tina Sharkey back in January. We're generally optimistic about the company's outlook in general. About Brandless now, they launched last year. They've since built up a substantial following on their website. They offer food, household, and HBA products, some home products as well, like linens and plates, for example. Products are, as the name implies, essentially private label. And there's no value-added statements added to labels but rather just product and ingredient details and allergen listings. And they're very good about listing allergens on their products. Everything on the site at a low price point. In addition, every item on Brandless.com is $3. When an item is cheaper, they're sold two for three or three for three. They offer free shipping as well on 13 items or more. And the majority of what is on their site is non-GMO and organic. And here's a quick clip from our interview with Tina Sharkey back in January at the NRF Big Show talking a little bit about Brandless and the overarching concept. Honestly, what my co-founder Ido Leffler and I really saw as the opportunity for Brandless was at the very, very highest level was to reimagine modern consumption. And I guess you can say something like that sitting at the NRF show because that's what many people are trying to do here. And starting with the things that people reach for every day, but taking a different pass at that, thinking about the better for you filter, the lifestyle filter, the values filter, and simplifying everything and eliminating what we call the brand tax, which was the unnecessary markups you pay for national brands of similar quality and really distilling it down to its simplest form. First and foremost, when you look at a supermarket, for example, 
the center of store, which is not, you know, where the perishables are, but where all of the staples are and all of the non-perishables have on average 20 to 40,000 SKUs. We got it down to 250, so we simplified that. We also looked at the packaging. We wanted to have packaging and labeling that actually educated people as to what things were and rid them of false narrative, of unnecessary signals and trying to figure out where you could find the values you're looking for, be it organic, be it gluten-free, be it sugar-free, be it no artificial colors or no animal testing as an example. And then we wanted to reduce it down to a simple price point. So everything at Brandless is $3. Some are two for three and some are three for three. So in a way, you almost don't have to bother checking prices. You don't have to bother benchmarking against other products. It just takes a lot of the complexity and the overconsumption and overproliferation of SKUs and products and messages and values down to a very simple form with what we call just what matters. Just what matters by category, so in beauty it's clean. Just what matters by food, all non-GMO, mostly organic. Just what matters by cleaning, all EPA Safer Choice certified. And everything that we sell at Brandless really is just what it says it is. So applesauce is applesauce, and multi-surface cleaner is multi-surface cleaner, and eliminating that false narrative so that people can live their own lives and tell their own stories. Those relationships between our social team, our customer service team, our product development team, and most importantly, our community are direct, and we can be in that kind of conversation all the time, and we are. All right, so now let's talk about this pop-up store that they're proposing. The pop-up store is located in Los Angeles. That'll run from May 1st through May 13th. And this is being branded as a pop-up with purpose. Now, they've always been very community-oriented, as you could hear Tina referred to during our interview, surrounding their customer community, that is. Not necessarily community-oriented regarding the city, but regarding the brandless community and the brandless ecosystem. As such, they plan on doing a live stream during the pop-up as well, and for every visitor, they're donating a meal to charity. Why the live stream? Well, this pop-up isn't just about selling product, although that is certainly part of it for a pop-up store, but they're planning on having various speakers and seminars about multiple topics, ranging from anything from health and food all the way to entrepreneurship, and people can register for certain events in advance. Sharky mentions that this will serve also as an educational experience for Brandless as well. This is a chance to basically have a ready-made focus group, if you will, for new product lines, regardless of whether the people visiting the pop-up are new to Brandless or they've already experienced the Brandless concept. Sharky also told Retail Dive in that aforementioned article, there are no further plans at the moment beyond the pop-up or for any permanent brick and mortar, but one cannot help but wonder if they'll take what they've gathered from this store and event after it's done on May 14th and repeat it as other pure plays in e-commerce have done in the recent past. The pop-up format may actually be able to replicate the effect that brick-and-mortar stores generally have on e-commerce companies. We've talked in the past about Indochino, Warby Parker, and Duluth Trading, how they've all expressed that e-commerce sales have increased significantly in markets where they have a store or showroom presence that is newly open. Brandless here is confident that they can draw customers in for the first time. They will become attached to their brand and part of that overarching brandless identity after the pop-up disappears. Also, the pop-up appears to be operating as a sort of customer appreciation opportunity for those that have already been interacting with the brand and who are already brandless customers. Kind of a chance for these customers to interact in person with brandless, much as Saddleback Leather does from time to time with their e-commerce customers. But this raises up an entirely different set of questions, Leighton. We've talked about pop-up stores from time to time in the past, but there's another aspect of this, which is that leasing works completely different. Being a landlord for one of these has a completely different scope. And also there are some legal issues to consider with pop-ups as well, not the least of which are insurance. Pop-up shops in general seem to bring to light relative instability in some older shopping centers. You see a Halloween Express go in to a space, for instance, that's been vacant for over two years. But it is undeniable that they have the ability to drive traffic to other shops that may be struggling at least over the last few months or so, we talk about L brand struggling during their latest earnings call. Well, anything that could help boost traffic could help boost traffic for any other retailer that's adjacent to the property. While some pop-up shops are short-lived, 
It can be viewed as something as a bit more experiential in nature, which has been a theme for mall owners such as Simon and GGP as they look to stay relevant in Class A spaces. Speaking of the landlord side, mall operators and larger shopping center REITs can benefit from having spaces filled that have been vacant for some time. I'll give you an example. Because of the short-term nature of pop-up shops, the landlords can direct the potential pop-up tenants to spaces that have more vacancy issues on average than the rest of their larger portfolio. Something not widely mentioned is the utilization of the space that is not always tallied for the gross lease area that we talk so often about with commercial real estate. That square footage for malls is very important. You think about the gross lease area, you're usually talking about the shops that are already built up on the sides of the walkways. Two examples of pop-up shops that can create more revenue opportunity for mall owners or kiosk type setups where the pop-up is taking space on a walkway or in the middle of a traffic way. And that is not normally leased out. So typically a lot of conventional malls do have kiosks that are normally rented out that are pretty much staged and conventional in fashion. But these pop-up shops end up coming along in a space that may not be ordinarily leased. Second, some pop-up shops like the ones that Casper has promoted are located in front of the shopping center or in a parking zone or even propped up on a sidewalk. These are definitely not areas that are normally used for conventional lease agreements and can be seen as an unforeseen boost to some mall's top line revenue. This is akin to food trucks that rent city space or county space on a short-term basis at non-peak traffic times. They don't want anyone to get in the way or to get ran over for these food trucks, but it is a way to extract revenue from the food trucks and create sort of a destination for nighttime goers. With this outside pop-up concept, things can get a little bit more tricky from the legal standpoint, as Trent had alluded to. Some cities and counties prohibit certain temporary shops in certain zoning areas that do not explicitly allow it. Also, previous title amendments may have covenants that pertain to certain parts of the property that prevent certain types of businesses versus others. For instance, there are certain companies that will exit a certain commercial property but then care about the community in the long term thus preventing a liquor store or a smoke shop going in a specific space. Previous landlords can sometimes play a sort of community steward in this way. Lastly, because of all the looming legal complexities, it behooves the business that is opening the pop-up shop to carry higher limits on liability and hazard insurance for the business going forward, which can, of course, draw up the cost of doing business in the first place, where insurance companies may not be too thrilled about underwriting a pop-up concept to begin with. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. And now we've reached the final segment of the Retail Focus Podcast, a segment we call Looking Ahead, where each late and I talk about one particular thing that we're keeping our eye on over the next week or the next month, and we begin with Leighton. So we had talked about Bonton stores and their bankruptcy and their ability to keep some stores open over the past couple of months, but it looks as though they are headed to an all-out liquidation as the company and the company's management was extremely bullish on keeping some stores open, but it looks as though there are more than 200 stores that are going to be put to the test here in the coming weeks. It looks as though they are out of answers as far as getting the right amount of liquidity to keep any of these stores open. And Trent, you know what that means. With any retail bankruptcy, obviously those news headlines are not going to be good. But what's worse is the employees, the longstanding salaried employees, the management, all of those people that have been in place for so long are going to be without a job in a matter of time. It looks as though there is going to be a winning bidder for the retailer's assets. It's going to be approved on Wednesday as of this week. The U.S. Bankruptcy Court in Wilmington, Delaware, said in certain court documents that a complete liquidation will have to be held. And overall, we just talked about mall owners, mall landlords. It's going to be tough to fill these somewhat large spaces in big parts of the country where some of these conventional malls were already considered B and C class. My looking ahead story could be one of any number of things. In fact, it could be talking about Best Buy and Amazon's new television partnership and looking ahead at all the reckless speculation that'll probably take place about Best Buy maybe being a target for Amazon, just like what happened with Kohl's. 
I might bring up the new website that will be unveiled later this month for Walmart, but instead I'm looking at another Amazon deal, and this tied in with Whole Foods. Market Watch reporting earlier this week that an email to rewards customers went out from Whole Foods mentioning that the rewards program that Whole Foods has started up will conclude, but that there will be additional announcements coming forward for Amazon Prime members. And this added that any account benefits, including membership and or unused rewards, will not roll into any future programs. Now, if this were anyone else, this would be bad press, just ending a loyalty program with a lot of rewards still out on the table. But being that it's Whole Foods, there's actually excitement here because of the possibility of a partnership with Amazon Prime members. And you feel like if you're an Amazon Prime member, you'll probably be able to be some sort of an additional Whole Foods benefits member, but we've yet to see what form that will actually take and how quickly that will be rolled out. And in fact, when this acquisition happened, a lot of analysts said that the platform would indeed be rolled out by now. Well, we haven't seen it by now, but we do see that Whole Foods rolling back their loyalty program may introduce a Prime loyalty program coming up. And actually, Amazon has noted in the past that they plan to make Prime the rewards program at Whole Foods. So the reason I'm looking ahead, what's the reward program going to look like for Prime members? Will it include discounts? And moreover, for Amazon, will it be a driver of Prime memberships? Or is that already saturated as far as a market? The more Amazon drives those Prime memberships, the more it's guaranteed income for the retail giant. And so that's what I'm looking ahead to see is just exactly how this rewards program will impact the Prime membership program and also how Whole Foods sales, even though they're not broken out too well in the Amazon earnings reports, whether those will be affected up or down after the new rewards program takes place that's tied into Prime. Well, that'll do it for us here at the Retail Focus Podcast. For Layton, I'm Trent. Coming up over the next three weeks, we've got a trio of very exciting interviews. We'll talk about stocking product and getting products stocked on retail shelves as a producer. We'll also talk a little bit more about retail labor over the next few weeks. So excited for that. Make sure and follow us at Retail Podcast on Twitter. Send us an email, retailpodcast at gmail.com, and we'll see you again seven days from now. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast. 